everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Chasing Frets. My name is Jason Shadrick, and I'm here with my co-host this week, Joe Gore. Hey, folks. And uh, as you heard on Monday, our guest this week is Ariel Posen, and we went super deep on slide guitar, and it was such a treat to kind of write <laughs> virtually over Zoom, kind of see him decode the magic uh, that he does when it comes to that and hear his perspectives on that. Yeah, he's one of those guys who um, not just plays beautifully, but he's very gifted at how he talks about it. Yeah. Um, he's really good at describing the process and what he's doing, which makes him the dream interview for <laughs> uh, for guitar nerds. Yeah, he's he's easy to talk to, that's that's for sure. But today's, today's topic was something that kind of popped up, uh, as you mentioned, uh, in an email thread the three of us had, and that was yeah, the nuances. Yeah. The nuances. Yeah, the way, the way he... Well, you know, when we were preparing these interviews, we, you know, we usually bounce topic ideas off artists. Sometimes we suggest them, sometimes they suggest them. So it's not a total surprise what the general subjects are. And he sent a list of possible topics and um, they were all good, but one phrase leapt out. One of his suggested topics was, quote, all the nuances other than the technical ones. Right. Well, so obviously I think, I want to hear about that. Yeah, because that, that really struck my eye too, because like you said, everything's technical to a certain degree, but I think the stuff that we covered in this episode, uh, much like an episode we, we did recently with, with Kim Perlack from Berkeley, where, where she outlined seven or eight factors that go into creating a note on the instrument, that there's all these things that are floating around in your head that you might not always be consciously practicing, but they all got to be there and, and coexist in order for you to sound like you, you know? And so that's going to be the, the topic for today's uh, episode. If you want to hit us up, you can get us at chasingfrets at premierguitar.com. And we'll, we'll hop right to it. So here's our second episode with Ariel Posen. I'm Dweezil Zappa. On my own musical journey, I've had two mentors. One of them was my dad. And the other was Edward Van Halen. <laughs> The impact Edward Van Halen made on music is enormous, and I find it fascinating to learn how top guitarists were affected and influenced by his playing. Every episode in this series will reveal something different about Van Halen's music. I'll be taking you on a song-by-song -song discovery of the nuances in the music that literally change people's lives. Put on your shoes. It's time to start running. Exclusively at DweezelZappa.com, a reward music powered artist site. Ariel, when we were discussing possible topics during the email, um, and some of the obvious ones, given who you are and how you play, or slide playing and alternate tunings, but uh, one thing you add on your added on your list really struck stuck with me as a phrase. You said, "All the nuances, other than the technical ones." I guess everything on guitar playing is technical in some way, but tell us what you meant about meant with that. Well, there's there's one example, and the the name of the song is escaping me at the moment. But there's this Neil Young song. Maybe you guys know what the tune is. The entire guitar solo. It's Cinnamon it's, Girl. It's, it's Cinnamon note. Girl, and Neil very is it Cinnamon Girl? Very Neil very famously said uh, to my former uh, guitar magazine colleague Jazz Obrecht when asked about the one note solo, he said, "What do you mean? Every note is different." <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean that song is. Is just too good on its take away that solo. The song's too good, but so much is said with one note, you know. And I think we get caught up, especially in this day and age of, and I mean this with no shade, but there's never been such a wealth of information and opinions on the internet with playing and music. And here's how you should do this. Here's five ways you should do this. Here's ten things you never thought about. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. I mean, like technically nothing here is wrong. But all the attention is always on 
playing more interesting notes, you know, playing these modes, you know, playing this sound more interesting with that. Uh, you know, and I always, whenever I do Skype lessons or stuff like that, everyone always says, you know, I've, I've kind of just said all I can on the pentatonic and I, I never believe them. I was like, I, I bet you, you have not even scraped the surface of what you could say in the pentatonic yet. My point here is that everyone gets so caught up in the notes and the technical side and there isn't enough, you know, attention, I guess you could say, put to just not what you're doing, but how you're doing it. It's so, like, for me, when I listen to music, when I listen to guitar players, any other instrument, it's about the feel. And certain players have such a distinct feel. And and that's why, you know, when you listen to Robin Ford and you grab a 335 or a telly and you plug it into a Dumble style amp and you sound nothing like him, it's because those hands... Yeah, they play some interesting note choices. He's the king of taking that altered scale to go from a one to a four chord. But it's the way his hands sound. And it's the way he's playing notes. You know, it, it's so specific to him. And any other player is the same thing. And that is what is so interesting and moving in music for me is, you know, mm-hmm. there's only so many notes in music. That's the one cheat code in music. All we're doing is taking the same notes and playing them over and over again in different keys. But how you're going to say them and what you can do to differentiate and, and put different spins on it and just put emotion into it, that's the difficult part. And that's something I find myself spending way more time on in my quote-unquote practice, even though these days I'd say my practice is just more playing, noodling, messing around. Mm-hmm. I'm far more interested in how something can sound rather than what needs to go into it to sound a certain way, if that makes sense. That leads me to two questions. One, how do you, when you're listening to uh, a player or listening to even yourself recorded back, how do you identify those nuances? And two, how do you lean into them more? Oof. How do I, identif- how do I identify my own or anyone? Or, I mean, what, what, like you said, if you're listening to Robin Ford. Right, sorry. Like how do, or, or you're listening to yourself, how do you orally identify those nuances you speak of and what do you do when you're playing whether you're practicing or on stage to bring those out of it out of your playing hmm well as a listener once you listen to somebody enough you you start to just latch on to their signature isms if you will and it's not just no choice but you know i think robin's a great example because no one really has that kind of touch the way he does it's so specific and yeah a lot of players tend to evolve, and he evolves too, but he, the core has always stayed the same. Mm-hmm. You listen to someone like an Eric Johnson or uh, who else? Basically, you can name anybody with such specific sounds. Strip away any effects. Strip away any gear. The gear doesn't matter. It's all those hands because everyone plays the same notes. Um, for me, it's, it's honestly such a hard thing to explain because it's not something I've ever thought about deeply it's more of just how i react to it and feel about it when i listen to it it's just like you know take jazz standards for example or take jazz for for example i love jazz uh i've spent time working on it i've spent a lot of time listening to it at the end of the day i would much rather hear someone take the most simple solo telling a story over autumn leaves at a really slow tempo tempo than like a burning giant steps or something like that. There's, there's, it's almost when there's too much going on with the feel and there's with the notes and everything. There's, there's not, there's no, there's, it's too much information coming out and it's hard to take anything in. Whereas, if you're taking in less information in your head and then what you put out, it's just easier to just, I guess, put something out that's, it's not necessarily more accessible but it's easier to listen to and it's more satisfying to listen to when you can almost chew on every note and taste like every element of the, of the play. And that can be on any instrument. So like for, for myself when I'm playing and when, I listen, when I've ever listened my, to myself back, I struggle sometimes live. You know, sometimes when you're live, you don't necessarily play 100% the way you want to, like if you were in the studio, because like you're trying to entertain a crowd, you're trying to run around on stage or like, I'm going to play to the stage left side or the stage right or the center stage. And sometimes you sacrifice a bit of your, depending what kind of entertainer you are, 
you sacrifice like the the musical side of it to a degree. Like if you listen to a board tape, and you're like, oh, that's definitely me running amok on stage because I'm kind of phoning in, the, <laughs> you know, that section or whatever. Uh, but the the nuances and the feel things that's every player's default. You know, the thing when I think I don't know. Sorry, I'm kind of this is so, it's, it's such a topic that's important to me. I almost can't find the words. Like you know when you when you listen to anybody and you're like. Oh, you've, you've, you've all, you guys have, I'm sure have played shows where people go up to you and rather than complimenting you, they compliment the instrument. Oh, that guitar sounds good. Oh, that amp sounds good. And it's like, no motherfucker. It's, it's my hands. It's, you know, people have this weird disconnect where they associate. And that's how I guess the, the music retail industry works is it's all about, yeah, you like the sound of how that sounds you know like well if you buy it you can sound like that and you never will you never never will it's because i'll I'll never forget i saw like noel gallagher do one of those ask me no what's what's the what's the thing called where ask me any ask me anything no it's when they're they like auto search everything on like they go undercover on you on the internet oh oh yeah they ask the internet questions or they answer the internet questions right yeah and it was just so very knoll but they're like how do someone said how do i sound like you on uh don't look back in anger or something like picked a random song and said how do i get that sound and how do i sound like you and he was just like well well you're not going to because you you don't have hands i mean you don't have these and he points to his hands you don't have this he points to his brain and you don't have this and he points to his heart and it's those three things really make up first of all your voice who you are as a musician as an artist because there's only one, really one of you out there. And it's really important to just go down that lane as, fa- as far as you can. You know, it's easy to sound like others sometimes. And everyone out there has taken inspiration from others, whether it's no choice, feel, overall artistry. But at some point, you leave them at the door and you kind of you keep going forward with it. And what Noel is saying, like, well, yeah, I mean, these things that the thing that you like about what my music is, that's what happens when I have spent time just playing. And when I don't think about it, that's who I am. That's what I do. And that is where those, I don't know, those little details come from because they're specific to everybody. Everyone's got their own little thing like that. And that's the beauty of music. One of the, one of the many. But I, I, just, I just wonder if, if notation plays into that because all the characteristics that you're talking about now are precisely what notation is not very good at capturing and i refer equally to standard notation into tablature you know notation Mm. is really good about telling people the notes you know here's the notes to play the solo here's the notes that make up a uh you know f mixolydian scale and it's very easy to you know capture that and replicate it but you know you can't depict in music the you know the millisecond delay that so and so has before they hit the note or the characteristic of their vibrato or how they sh- shape a sustained note over time. I was just talking about this with a friend yesterday, specifically about that guitar player's reading notation. And the way that music is written out and notated, even in tab, it's just not, you cannot write it out in a way that it's supposed to be played on guitar. It can only get you, it can only get you so far. It can yeah. only get you so far. And so I was, we were specifically talking about musical theater gigs and pit gigs which I haven't done in years, but I used to do a little bit of that. And I was just telling him how, first of all, you got to learn a, a full book, like a full show. And, and a lot of these things have a lot of, they, they treat guitar like it's a horn instrument or like a piano. It's like guitar players are out there sweating because we're not supposed to play all these 16th notes and read them. So I probably memorized most of the show. So just I could, I could memorize it and then play it with feeling, not just, okay, 16th note, 16th note, dotted eight. You know, you want it. When I read music and play it, for the most part, I don't sound like myself because I'm so focused on playing the right note that I don't put any attention to how I'm playing it at all. And that's where all the, that's when all the feeling goes out the window and you lose that. And there are a lot of people out there. And I always say reading music is a skill. I don't know that there's necessarily talent to it. It's just one of those things that if you spend a lot of time reading it and learning how to read it, that you can sight read very well and play with feeling. I know so many players, not just guitar players, <laughs> specifically not <laughs> guitar players, that, that that can read <laughs> their ass off and and move you yeah. to tears at the same time. Oh yeah. You know, it, it's it's very much possible. But I just don't think guitar is meant to be played. I mean classical guitar, maybe. But even so, 
No. Yeah, I, I don't know. it's That's funny you bring opinion. up the pig gigs. I've done a fair amount of pig gigs over the last couple of years, and it like it shocks me. I had one guy one time. I I was in a situation where the MD didn't send me a transposed part because he thought I could just bring a capo, and I'm like, no, it doesn't oh. doesn't quite quite work like that. You know what I mean? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, I had to just transpose stuff. But I, I I agree, it is a skill, and to me, it's for guitar players, it's an undervalued skill, unfortunately. You know, and mm. there's so much more music you're able to access and understand and pick apart by possessing that skill. You know, learning by ear yes. is one thing, and that's great. Agreed. And no matter what, you should do that. But being able to look at some notes on a page. And not even like the speed of being able to see them and have them come out your instrument. Like that to me is, is not as important as being able to understand what's on the page and know that, oh, those three notes together, oh, that's just a C chord or that's just an F chord. Yeah. At the end of the day, right? Like music is just this language and it's just a matter of speaking fluently to a degree where you don't sound like you're fumbling your words or you don't know what you're talking about or you're using... Oh, it's like that word doesn't necessarily mean what you meant to say. <laughs> that can that can happen with your playing, you know? And it's, it usually comes from people just not necessarily putting the time into the understanding of the language. And again, I, I can't stress enough that knowing theory is not going to make you a better musician. Not at all. However, understanding what goes into what makes a chord, what, you know, what this scale is, what that note is, that's what helps you sound more sophisticated, you know, like intervals, for example, you know, I, I don't have perfect pitch, but with intervals, I can see them as colors and seeing intervals as colors lets me know, or at least I can hear a song. I can hear a, a passage and I go, well, maybe I don't know what key this is in, but that's flat three, four, five, flat three, one, you know, or whatever the example is, it's identifying them and it's training your ear. It's basically ear training without recognizing what, what the pitch is. Because perfect pitch is basically seeing color, but the with the key. Have you worked with anybody Which that I, has perfect pitch? Oh, plenty. What's, what's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I have not. Like, is that a burden in some yeah. ways? I, 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 yeah, I know a handful of people. In fact, yeah, some of them are very modest with it. Most are very modest and don't draw attention to it at all. Oh, there's a lot that that's a lot that you know. That, oh, that car horn is like a hundred cents flat from F sharp. You know, the, the, who like rub it in your face? Yeah, my bass player uh, Julian. He won't care if I say this, but like he might might be the most humble, <laughs> perfect pitch musician I know. I remember one time, like first of all, he's an incredible musician. Uh, he definitely has perfect pitch. You know, he he'll never even though if you're wrong, if you're out of tune, he'll go along with, <laughs> with what you're doing, even though he knows it's wrong. I'll never forget we were at a show once and somehow we got on the topic of this and uh, I was talking to another someone else in the other band and it's like, yeah, it was it, like this note, right? Uh, they were singing a note. What is that? And I and I just go to oh, Julian. I asked his name's Julian. What is that? He's like, oh, that's, yeah, that's an E. Very shyly, humble, you know, uh, that's an E. And then these people were saying, no, it's not. You're, you're wrong. Like, that's not, that can't be an E. They're pulling out their phone. And I get, guys, he has perfect pitch. Like, there's no, you're wrong. <laughs> like, it's like him seeing a green wall that's painted green and you telling him that it's blue. Of course, if, like, maybe if you're colorblind, that's a different thing, but. There's no, it's black or white. It's either that note or it's not. And like, they just couldn't wrap their head around it. But I know a lot of other people also with perfect pitch where you even pick up your instrument and it's slightly out of tune and it resonates. They're like, oh, drives, drives them nuts. So I think there's various degrees of how, how much of a blessing or a curse it could be. I think it depends on how much you let it affect you, I guess. <laughs> well, I think I think musicians with perfect pitch who've worked a lot with others and know how to get along with other musicians have long since learned not to uh, not to be obnoxious about it or to uh, you know be be telling everybody that they're you know a little bit flat. But um, uh, it's I think it's kind of an independent variable from uh, from other aspects of musicianship. Like it's you know if I could have perfect pitch suddenly granted to me, I'd take it. 
And it's true. The, I, I think the very best musician I know has perfect pitch. But uh, obviously the world is full of incredibly sensitive listeners with great ears who can't tell whether the wall is, is green or orange you yep. know, at first glance. No, I, I would definitely agree. It's not a necessity to be at that top level. It does have its it does have its advantages. You know, the way the advantages that I see is obviously sitting in with a band, sitting into a musical situation, and you know, yeah, just play it. I'll figure it out. Like you just literally hear it and you can start playing. Some people, for me, like I'll probably ask, okay, yeah, what what key? And I'll go G, and then I'll listen, and I can still figure it out because I can hear what the chord changes are based on ear training that I've done and spending so much time really working on it and training myself to strengthen my ears that way. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, it's not as fluid as sitting there and going, yep, yeah, okay, I got the song because I just can hear every element of and everything that's going on here. Yeah, let's go. But, sure, but surely you can, you know, when you if, if a song's playing and you don't know it, I mean, you just run a finger up the up the string and you find that you find the tonic pretty fat i mean you know, it's probably like a three second process right totally yeah i think that's the that'd be the classic way for us all but also i don't know about you guys but to some degrees i i kind of have guitar i want to be careful how i say this i definitely don't have again i don't have perfect pitch but on guitar sometimes i can hear like i can hear oh that's a g that's a d that's an a you can just hear those shapes I absolutely yeah. the D chord. The, the D chord is the first one that I remember hearing. That it could have been a James Taylor song or something, but when you hear that little guitar move he does, mm. and the, the and the intervallic structure of that chord, that to me, like it, it might not be a D. They could be capoed up. It could be E F whatever, but the shape of that chord I can hear. Clearly, the three of us perceive it that way, and a lot of guitarists too. You you know you don't know, you don't have the perfect pitch to know that. You know, you're hearing you're hearing you know a um, 110 or a 220 hertz per second, but you hear that you hear the tessitura and the voicing of the A chord, and you say, well, obviously that song's in you know in A. I know those oh, no, I know those voicings. I know how they vibrate and yeah. how they sound. And sadly, that's not perfect pitch, but <laughs> but it's a good skill to have. I, th I think for me, a big part of it was listening to a lot of bluegrass and newgrass folk music. Ten years ago, I really fell down that heavy rabbit hole, and for guitar, I mean, you, you basically either play in G shape, you play in C, or you play in D, and you capo everywhere. And I feel like listening to so much of that strengthened my, like, oh, yeah, like, that's G position, but they're just playing in B, or that's mm -hmm. C shape, they're playing, you know? It's, it's, it's like hearing the notes in specific orders, hearing that C shape is always going to be that, like, one, three, five, one, and a G shape is always going to be one, three, five, one, five, or three depending if you leave the, you know, the fifth uh, string open or not. Those right. little elements play into some mus muscle memory in your in your ear training to hear that. Well, Ariel, it's been such a great time nerding out with you on, on notation and ear training and everything. And, and thanks again for joining us this week. Pleasure. And uh, we'll be back later this week. Talk to you guys later. Bye.